Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you're watching PBS Books. Welcome. PBS Books, in collaboration with Masterpiece, is pleased to host a conversation with executive producer and screenwriter Gwyneth Hughes discussing her new adaptation of Tom Jones. This four part television miniseries reimagines the history of Tom Jones, a foundling, Henry Fielding's classic novel delighting and scandalizing readers since it was first published in 1749. This is a, a picturesque story of the Tom Jones complicated journey to find real love. Let's take a moment to watch the trailer. Once upon a time, there lived a boy called Tom. My Tom Jones. You don't want to be giving your heart to a bad boy. It doesn't seem bad to me. I confess to you that I love her with all my heart. She was promised to me. Let battle commence. Of course, duty is important, but so is love. Ugh. Tom Jones on Masterpiece. Just a reminder that Tom Jones begins airing on PBS on Sunday, April 30th at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll check your local listing. Well, we'd like to thank our library partners, more than 1,800 strong around the country, as well as numerous PBS stations across the nation. But most importantly, we'd like to thank all of you for joining us this evening. Well, the moment you've been waiting for, it is my extraordinary pleasure to introduce Gwyneth Hughes, the creator of Tom Jones, new adaptation. Gwyneth was Hughes was born in London. She studied Russian at Sussex University, becoming a newspaper reporter on the Sheffield Morning Telegraph. Gwyn's first job in television was on the Yorkshire Television Regional News Desk. From there, she became a BAFTA-nominated documentary director specializing in history and true crime, and began her move from factual into drama on episodes. Her original thriller miniseries, Five Days, and her Tippi Hedren biopic, The Girl, were both nominated for BAFTAs and the Golden Globes. Her classic dramatizations included The Mystery of Edwin Drood, Vanity Fair, and Miss Austin Regrets. She lives with her husband in North Yorkshire. Welcome, Gwyn. Hello, it's good to be here. Oh, it's so great to have you, Gwyn. Um, so I, you know, it's so amazing. Henry Fielding's The History of Tom Jones, a found, foundling, was written in 1749, nearly 275 years ago. How did this project come about now? Oh, wow, 275 years. That sounds like a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, I can tell you that this is a very long book with a lot of very long words in it. So um, you should all be glad that I've read it. Now you don't have to. Uh, but it is a great book. It's a book of um, that's just a classic in every way. It's extremely funny. It's very romantic. It's exactly the tonic that I think we all need after this terrible couple of years with the pandemic and so on. So I think the idea of doing it just came from that, that we were looking for something to cheer us all up those of us who worked on it <laughs> and also we hope obviously the people who are going to watch it because it really is just shed loads of fun well you know it's it's interesting right because henry fielding is considered to be one of the most important english authors of the 18th century and fielding wrote really depicting ordinary english life at a time when novels were actually new what surprised you most as you read Fielding's very long novel? I think what surprised me most was that it spoke so directly to me across, you know, nearly 300 years. It's um, it's obviously lots of terrible old long words and very ornate and flowery way of expressing themselves, everybody has, but still the um, their dilemmas and their adventures spoke to me very directly. You know, it's a, it's, it's a charming love story. It's also rude and naughty and, and great fun. And I just always felt that I was in the room with Henry Fielding, that this um, lovely, funny, extraordinary man was just sitting, at, looking over my shoulder and, and guiding my steps to try and bring his fantastic book to the screen. 
again it has been done before but a long time ago yes you know and it's interesting because as i started um reading his book as well you know i know i felt the humor i almost thought and not written at all in the style of shakespeare but i thought some of the humor was a little shakespearean um and as i read this law you know the the portion i read and it was so much longer. <laughs> I wondered how were you able to condense this very long book or books into four episodes? Yeah, well, that's the big problem, isn't it? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh, great gig, yeah. And I mean, I bite the hand off the person who offered me this thing. And then you look at a thousand pages and you think about four hours of television. And yeah, where do you start? I mean, I think you just have to condense it down to um, its main thematic uh issues and and that is the story of a young fellow who um who doesn't know who he is it's it's all about identity really again another very modern preoccupation of ours this is a young man who doesn't know who he is and goes through many adventures um to reach the point where through achieving true love with his lovely sophia he finds out who he is and he is able to be happy and that's um you know, another thing you just think, oh, how wonderful. It, you know what Tom Jones really is, even though it's nearly 300 years old, it really is a kind of rom-com. That's what it is. It's in that tradition. Or maybe it invented that tradition. <laughs> Can, that, maybe Shakespeare wrote the old rom-com as well, but he wasn't the novelist. And I think that the attraction of that form, the attraction of watching two lovers, you know, are meant to be together, stumbling and struggling towards happiness is very satisfying. Yeah having you speak about the, the, the idea of a rom-com and, and, um, and I'd have to agree that that did come through very much in, in, in the, in the novel. Um, but, but there are, I'm sure many differences. What do you think the biggest differences are between Fielding's novel and your adaptation? Apart from the length and the long words. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I cut out some characters and I've amalgamated some other characters and um, I've probably made it, I've kind of, in a rom-com, the two characters, the two lovers are kept apart. And in the book, they are really kept apart. They hardly spend any time together at all. And I think I probably, I think, you know, what I noticed, this isn't really a change. I'm sorry, I'm not really answering your question. But what I was struck by in the book, something that surprised me very much, is that you would imagine that writing so long ago, you know, we tend to think ago, girls were all sort of soppy and you know, um, ineffective, and the men made all the running. But that's not the case in Tom Jones. It's not the case in Fielding at all. And I was really struck by how um, active Sophia is, how active all the women are. You know, they pursue Tom, more than do. Poor old Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Pursued about the planet by Randy women. And that's sort of what the um, what the story is. Um, sorry, do you? Yes, no, I... Why did you decide to use Sophia as the the narrative, the the overvoice of the adaptation? She doesn't really narrate it. She has a few bits of voiceover where she tells us, um, she sets the scene for us and she tells us what's happening next and she tells us why she's making her decisions. So she, we do, she is more centre stage than she is in the book. But the, she is a big character in the book too, you know. She's a big, lively, feisty woman. She's not... She's not a soppy thing. And she, you know, she takes really big decisions. She leaves home to pursue this extremely unsuitable boyfriend. And that's, you know, to this day, very difficult. And in the mid 18th century, completely adventurous and brave. So I was very struck by her agency, if you like. And I think, um, yeah, and, and also there's something else. So I'm not making a change in the book at all, I don't think. I'm just noticing something, probably, probably because I'm a woman writer. I'm noticing something about her that, maybe previous adaptations have not been so interested in, that she is this fantastically active and vibrant character and not someone in a pink dress. <laughs> <laughs> very, very true. Now her character, she is a neighbor, but her, uh, can you speak a little bit about how did the decision to make Sophia the, the daughter of a Caribbean slave, how did that come about? Well, I think everybody these days is trying to um, uh, create more diverse drama to to reflect and animate and imagine the lives of more diverse casts of characters than we used to. Now, it has to be said that Henry Fielding wasn't remotely interested in slavery. 
he didn't, there's no black characters in, in the book at all. It's not his thing. Nobody was at the time. You know, this is this book was written before. I mean, slavery was up and running and, and, and massive and awful when Fielding was writing. But abolitionism wasn't. You know, he was writing before anybody was beginning to think about abolition. So it's an entirely different universe. And when you look back at that from our perspective now, I just thought, God, you know, you can't actually even think about the 18th century in England or indeed America without this massive elephant in the room, which is slavery. And how do we how do we even go there? How do we even think about the 18th century and not mention that and not go there? You know, what does that say to our black audiences? Mm -hmm. So putting all those things together, it became I started to think, how can we do this? How can we have um, a black character who is true, not just like that thing, you know, um, colorblind casting where you just bung in people of any um, uh, ethnic background into any part? which some people do. I didn't want to do that. You know, I wanted there to be a really good reason why our Sophia was a mixed heritage girl from the Caribbean. And so I did a lot of work, a lot of history reading, uh, which I love. <laughs> it's much more fun than writing. <laughs> Read a lot of books, spoke to historians, began to see that it was perfectly possible and indeed kind of happened. You know, they, in the, the, we are talking about the Caribbean. We're not talking about... Um, the United States. We're not talking about, if you like, the mainland at all. This is the Caribbean. And in the Caribbean, this kind of thing was happening. Uh, people, uh, slavers, men were taking um, uh, slave women and in some cases having multiple children with the same woman, forming a kind of relationship, if you like, with them. And those children were on occasion sent back to England to be educated. You know, they were taken into English families, educated, raised. So what happens to our Sophia in Tom Jones is entirely possible. Um, it isn't in the book, but it's entirely possible and entirely historically achievable. And I'm very proud of it. I think it's great. I mean, I think, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled that we managed to, I hope we pulled it off. I, I think we did. I think you did. Where did you... Um... You said you spoke to people and you did research, you read books. Was there a library you utilized? Was there, you know, how did you, how did you really go about that research? We just sniffed around a lot of books. Um, and then we uh, went looking for a consultant and found, an, you know, a proper historian who knew a lot more than us to help us uh, make this story work and found this, this perfect person, I mean, honestly designed by God or something, who is a, uh, she's a, a wonderful woman historian who is, um, a black woman of Jamaican heritage who is American. She's from Virginia, but she's of Jamaican heritage. I mean, oh, perfect. She was just lovely, very um, fierce and very, very keen that we should get it right. And she helped us a lot at, at every turn to, to, make, um, to make our storyline uh, work and be respectable and, and respectful. Um, I, yeah, I owe her a lot. I'm really um, grateful to her. What do you hope that viewers will think of Sophia? Oh, I think, well, I hope they'll love her as much as Henry Fielding did and as much as I do. I mean, she's a wonderful young woman. You know, she's just, um, you know, she's quite spoiled. She's in the sense that she's been adored all her life by all her English life by her grandfather, who's brought her across the ocean. Um, and he's a daughter and spoiled her and raised her as a sort of gorgeous, young, wealthy, landowning woman. She she doesn't, she's 18, she's nothing, nothing since she got to England has gone wrong. And then suddenly everything goes wrong and she copes. And it's funny because the book is famously, um, you know, Tom, loads of women, all the women fancy Tom, which they do. Um, but actually the, the energy in the book is, is coming from Sophia, the romantic energy is coming from her. She pursues him she gives up everything to try to um be with him and ultimately marry him uh, while he's being a bit sort of useless and <laughs> a bit a bit 20 she's the one she's the strong character she's the one who does the pursuing and I, I love her for that and and the actress is just terrific you know she's an Australian girl um and she um she's just got such energy and and vim and she inhabits these sort of corsets and 18th century dresses with great modern flair which yeah yeah we're, <laughs> great girl. we're very pleased with her well in the novel uh the narrator starts saying that the book will explore human nature um in the adaptation how are sex 
and desire depicted differently than the book? Well, how are they depicted differently from the book? Mm. I mean, I think the thing about the book is that I, when I began this and I embarked on reading the book, I felt a little bit, mm, I bet it's going to be really sexy in an unpleasant masculine way. I'm not going to like it. I'm going to feel, oh, what about the girls? <laughs> and the book actually, this may be something about the 18th century, pre-Victorian times, you know, but free times. Um, the girls are absolutely up for it. They all pursue Tom. Tom is gorgeous. Everybody loves him. Everybody wants a piece of him. And all these women are in it for the fun and the and the love and they are um all you know consenting everybody fully consents in a way that I hadn't expected and I didn't and, and I found absolutely charming and in fact the only person whose consent is ultimately an issue is poor old Tom who later on in the um story falls under the spell of a, of a wealthy older woman a cougar if you like with the modern parlance who he can't get away from and, and he's the one whose consent becomes slightly an issue. But, yeah, so I don't know if it is different from the book. I think it's different from other adaptations because there's something funny. How the, the book is fantastically generous towards women and towards women's feelings and, and romantic, erotic feelings, if you like, in a way that um, often adaptations of historical novels are not. You know, it's all about blokes running after women. But it, the fielding isn't like that. Fielding... You know, it's absolutely clear in Fielding, and I hope also in our show, that he accepts that men and women have equal desires, and it's just that, especially then, women had so much more to lose by acting on them. And he's very clear-sighted about that. Um, and that's the environment in which Sophia has to continue to try to be pure and to try to preserve her virginity, which is hugely important to her, um, in spite of all this going on around her. And I think I just took that from the book, actually. I don't think it is different. It is a lot of modern day thinking in, in some way. <laughs> but my question for you is, why do you think Sophia ultimately forgives Tom's wrongdoings? Oh, well, she loves him. <laughs> and it's just a rom-com. They've got to get together. <laughs> yeah, I, I love him too. So I don't, you know, a thing that I would like to say about Tom is that, um, it's a thousand pages and he has three women in it, which I don't think is too bad. <laughs> I, mean, I don't think it's really um, promiscuous behaviour. It's a bit youthful and silly and sowing wild oats and just a bit thoughtless, but he's 20. I mean, I think the whole thing about all these books, all these old classic books, they're all about the same thing. You know, Jane Austen, Charles Dickens, this, they're about someone on the cusp of adulthood who is making a lot of mistakes as a, as a young person who's not really fully a man yet, who during the course of the book becomes a man or indeed a woman and in the end gets married, which is the signifier for adulthood in those times, of course. And that's the thing with Tom, he make, he's making all these mistakes, but he he doesn't, they don't, they're not him. He, his real self is utterly loving. I mean, the, the thing that you mainly notice about Tom Jones is that he is full of love. He loves everybody and everything. He mainly loves Sophia. And so he's a bit of an idiot. And so he has the odd affair that he probably shouldn't have. But he's 20 years old. And women are throwing themselves at him. So I forgive him. I'm old enough to be his granny, but I forgive him. <laughs> so, yeah, I think she forgives him because she, they can be happy ever after. And because it suited Henry Fielding that she should forgive him, <laughs> as it suits me. <laughs> well, for those, those of you out there just joining us. I'm Heather Marie Montillo. You're watching PBS Books. It's my pleasure to be here with Gwyn Hughes, who is the, the screenwriter, executive producer of the much anticipated new adaptation of Tom Jones. Back to the conversation. So a great segue from what we were discussing before is why do you think Tom Jones insists on being a gentleman? Why is it so important to to him to be this gentleman? Well, a gentleman in those days, the word gentleman has undergone a lot of transformations in its life. And I think in those days, in the mid 18th century, it was sort of just going through a transformation, which was from um, not a transformation, like adding new meanings to itself. So it had meant someone who was wealthy, someone who was who had money behind them, someone who wasn't a peasant someone who would have a decent life and not have to starve. 
very important distinction. But it was beginning to get new meanings around uh, conduct. Like, so as we would say today, oh, he's a real gentleman. What do we mean? We mean he's kind and he's, he's, um, he's kind to women and children. He's polite and he's definitely worth knowing. We, we mean a whole load of things like that. And those meanings were beginning to come in in Tom's time. So for Tom, who doesn't know who he is, for Tom, who is illegitimate and doesn't know who his father is, um, the identity of gentleman is very, very important. He, 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 he has been taken in as an adopted child into this house full of gentlemen and he wants to be one. But he keeps being a bit of an idiot and a bit sort of a scamp and a bit kind of naughty and um, jeopardising his own ability to be a gentleman, uh, both in terms of wealth and connection, but also in terms of conduct that he can be proud of. So I think it's it's a sort of, um, it's like being a gentleman, it's like being a grown man that you, uh, in a way that you can be proud of in yourself and, you know, and marriageable, very importantly. What impression of Tom do you hope viewers leave with? And I heard, you know, he's kind, he's obviously very handsome. <laughs> But what are the, you know, as as you think and someone is done with the four the four episodes, what is the takeaway that you'd like viewers to leave with? I think I'd like them to see him the way I do, which is um, with, in, with indulgence, with forgiveness, to say that, you know, he has been a bit of a nit. He's been a bit of a, you know, fool. He's uh, not always obeyed his own standards of conduct, which are high, but whenever Tom Jones behaves like himself, whenever he makes choices which go along with his true self, which is a, a self who is extremely loving and kind and um, virtuous, he is a truly virtuous character. And when he remembers that, and when he remembers that those kindness and virtue are uh, qualities that he should aspire to at all times, then he's just the most gorgeous young man on the planet. You'd be proud to have him as a son or indeed grandson, um, or husband. <laughs> and he's got to the point of putting all that youthful nonsense behind him. And on the basis of that knowledge that he now has, that wisdom he now has, he becomes this big, gorgeous husband. Mm -hmm. And that's what I hope everybody will go away going, oh, I'd have married him. I would. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, since Biffle and Tom grow up together in the same household, there is this sense of, this true sense of rivalry. Why do you think Biffle hates Tom. Oh, poor Bliffle. He looks at Tom and sees someone that everybody can't help loving. I mean, he's a rather awkward boy, is Bliffle. He's a bit sort of, he's a bit pompous. He's like his father. He's just, nobody really likes him. And everybody loves Tom. Everybody has always loved Tom and they always will. And poor old Bliffle will never be able to compete with him for girls, for the affection of their, of, of their uncle. I mean, it's, yeah. Bliffle has all the money and all the position because he's the legitimate heir to the estate, but he doesn't have Tom's looks or Tom's charm or, yeah, any of those things. Lady Balliston uh, is such an iconic character. How does she differ in the book or does she differ in the book and the adaptation? I think Our Lady Bellaston is much funnier than the one in the book. I mean, and that's entirely down to um, Hannah, who plays her, just I mean, it's an extraordinary performance. We were so lucky to get her, Annie Waddingham, um, to come and play Lady Bellaston. Uh, and she is, oh, it's just, it's just a joy to watch. I just think she's brilliant. Um, and I, I think the main difference, actually, is, is that... In Fielding, he, he thinks Lady Bellison is a silly cow, basically. He thinks that she is past it. She shouldn't be interested in Tom at all. She's just using him. She just, you know, is not a nice person. But he does accept that Lady Bellison does fall very hard for Tom, which I think is really sad because she can't have him. He's too young. He's too poor. She's madly in love with him and she can't have him. And Fielding kind of thinks that's funny. And I think it's really sad. <laughs> so... In the book, um, Fielding doesn't really give Lady Bellaston an exit. I mean, he doesn't really, she just kind of fades away. I think she even goes to the wedding. <laughs> just, and I thought that was a bit hard on her. So I've given her a really big exit. And that is very different to the book. What happens in the end to and with Lady Bellaston is, um, uh, well, I'm not going to claim it's an improvement on the book, but it's, it's a lot more than we see in the book. I mean, I just love her. She's a fantastic character. For sure. Yeah. 
sure. Um, do you have, I mean, I know you've written the, the screenplay. Um, do you have a favorite part that maybe it's your favorite because of how the actors embody it? Do you have a favorite part that you can recall? And I know it's like picking your favorite child on some level, which one loves it all, but is there something that really stuck with you that, that you love? Oh, wow. That's a hard one. I love so much of it. Um, there's a brilliant scene. It's just a stupid little scene. It's just funny where Lady Bulliston is hiding behind the screen in Tom's bedroom when uh, Sophia's maid comes to see him to ask for his help. And it's just so <laughs> incredibly stupid. She's hiding behind the screen and the maid catches sight of these two daft big white feathers that Lady Bellison is wearing on her head that stick up above the screen. And Hannah just keeps doing this. You can't see Hannah, you can just see this like bunny ears doing that. Honestly, it makes me weak with laughter every time I see it. <laughs> it's very stupid. <laughs> Not a serious answer at all, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but it is actually a very fun, funny part. And and for, for sure, it's something I, I recall. Um, ultimately, what do you hope someone walks away from watching this series? I just hope that it will bring joy to people. It's just a completely uncomplicated, gorgeous love story. It's funny. It's also quite sad in places. It's it's very engaging, I think. The characters are all marvellous, larger than life. And I just think after the couple of years we've had, just come away from this thinking, oh, look, there was a time when people could meet and fall in love and you know, their eyes would meet across the stable yard and they would fall in love and there would be no internet pornography and no Tinder and no kind of nothing getting in the way of two beautiful young people finding each other and embarking on life together. And whoa, oh, I hope people would just go, oh, that was great. You know, uh, just love you. <laughs> a beautiful thought. Um, so tell us, what else are you working on? Where are you? What are you what are you doing? Um, this is such a huge work. I know it's much anticipated. We can't wait for for April 30th where people can see it. But what are you what are you doing? What's next? Oh, well, these beautiful, perfect gigs like Tom Jones don't come along very often. There's not much classic <laughs> adaptation going on. And I just thrilled to get this one. And, you know, anybody else? out there wants me to do another one <laughs> I'm yours <laughs> at the moment I'm doing um, a really fabulous project but it's much it's serious it's contemporary it's a true story about um, the worst most widespread miscarriage of justice in British history um, which is going on to this day uh, and uh, involves thousands of people who were wrongly accused of theft by their employer and it all turned out to be about a computer that had gone wrong so a lot of um, interesting um, thought-provoking stuff there uh, but they're real people it's the 21st century um it's very sad very dreadful and um very scandalous and not at all like tom jones complete change of <laughs> change it of sounds scene. like you're leaning in more to your journalistic instincts in your writing yeah i mean i do quite a lot of true stories and it i, I was a journalist um for some years and i still am a journalist in many ways so coming out of that environment working with real people telling people stories you know the ethical um, dilemmas and, and all of that um, I it's nice to it, it's great to do those and it's nice to come out every so often and rush off into a sunlit meadow with Tom and Sophia and <laughs> have romantic fun yeah it's been a great break <laughs> well thank you so much for this and thank you so much for Tom Jones the new adaptation um, I just think that it will bring so many joy and laughter and um, romance. And so we are so appreciate Gwen for for your creativity, for your 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 time and coming here and sharing some real true insights with all of us. So thank you. Thank you. Well, we need to close the program, but I want to remind everyone that Tom Jones airs on April. 30th, Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard P on your local PBS. Check your local listing. Until next time, I'm Heather Marie Montia and happy reading. Mm -hmm.